I V M. We would like to thank Storytel for sponsoring this show. Storytel is an audiobook platform that's available on your mobile, on your PC, wherever you'd like to listen to this. So what I'm going to recommend this week is a story that I first read when I was in school. It's Kabuliwala by Rabindranath Tagore. I, of course, read this in Hindi. It was part of my Hindi text. The original is in Bengali. But you know what Storytel has? It has an English translation of this story. And it's not just this story. There are a number of Rabindranath Tagore stories that they have. They have the hungry stones. They have the solemn vision. They have forsake. Really, really good stuff. So, I mean, like, definitely go check it out. Get a bunch of Rabindranath Tagore books in your first month. And go and sign up at Storytel.com slash IVM. And you'll be able to get your first month for just 99 Rupees instead of two ninety nine. That's two hundred bucks off your first month. Go, go, go now. Welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast by the Takshashila Institution. We are a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like bringing fresh perspectives to Indian affairs and Indian perspectives to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hello and welcome to All Things Policy. It's a brand new year, but we're still looking at what we've done in 2020. Um, it gave us all a lot of time to sit back at home. There was lots of work, but we also had a lot of interesting reading. Uh, and this was an opportunity to actually catch up on a lot of different things. Uh, uh, and Rohan, I know my colleague who's here with me today for this conversation, um, has done something that he he sort of surpassed his goals for 2020. Um, When the year began, Rohan had promised uh, publicly that he would read 30 books this year in 2020, yet he ended up reading 52. Now, I'm a little iffy because there are 52 weeks and Rohan says he's read 52 books, 52 books through the year, but he says he's done that. So we're going to first try and talk to him about how he first managed to read 52 books through the year. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about the interesting books that he and Nitin have read. So once again, welcome to All Things Policy. Uh, and we start with this conversation with Rohan. Rohan, first tell me, how did you manage reading a book a year? Did you actually read them? Um, it, that's a good question, actually. I, I read half of them and I listened to the other half. Um, so basically, any time of the day that I wasn't working, I was reading or listening to things. Um, so it was it was literally like I had, my whole day was divided into either listening to Especially Shashi Tharoor, uh, I listened to him a lot, and um, and other authors who read out their audiobooks, and other and I and I got an iPad this year, so I highlight I wanted to highlight things a lot. So I all the books that I had, I managed to highlight um, so much of them that um, it was just extremely fun. So a lot of listening, a lot of reading, and and somehow I made it to a book a week, and I am at fifty two now. Going to do this again this year. So Rohan, I want to ask you one thing because even I tried listening after listening to you talking about listening for so long. Uh, I tried doing that. Uh, and I realized that, uh, you know, uh, it depends on the voice that you're listening to, uh, but most really good voices, I'd fall asleep within half an hour. Uh, so how did you manage that? I mean, and this is not just me. I know that a lot of people struggle with that. Uh, firstly, because listening can, particularly the voice is really good. Uh, it can end up being, you can end up being very drowsy. And secondly, also, you don't necessarily retain as much as when you read. So how do you sort of deal with that? Well, so I think, my main coping mechanism is that I, I, the full disclaimer, I don't listen on 1x or I don't, don't listen on 2x or 3x or 1.5x. It's really hard for me because I don't retain a lot if I listen fast. I, that's just, I guess, a flaw in my system. But um, I only listen at 1x. And and while I'm listening, I'm, I do an industrial amount of bartan washing <laughs> and uh, cleaning my room and stuff like that. So it, it, basically just anything that's very admin and sounds like drudgery to me that doesn't want me to apply a lot of my brain power to it. Anything that isn't deep work, basically, I try to do while listening to books and all the other times I'm just reading them. So, and as far as retention is concerned, I think making notes actively or making bookmarks in the books is helpful. So I use playbooks um, to read or listen. In playbooks, the, the good feature is that... Um, if you're making notes, it makes actually a Google document for all the notes you're making. So all all your stuff's actually in one place. So you don't have to actually look at what you said when you said it. It, it does it, it does a great job of it. Um, so this is not a Google endorsement or advertisement, but like generally good good job, guys. Uh, so yeah, it helps you critically engage with the content because you know that all your stuff's in one place. You can always link back to it and stuff. So that that's my method. Okay, so I think my mistake was that while I was listening, I was closing my eyes and sitting on the couch. 
Uh, so I shouldn't be doing that. I should be being active while I'm listening to these books. Okay, so interesting. Uh, Burton washing is great. Like, great. Actually. Okay, so you're washing washing utensils is a good idea. Yes, I've done a lot of that this year, but I didn't do that while listening. Uh, I did that while grumbling. Um, but okay, so that makes sense to me. That I think that's uh, that's an interesting tip that people can do. That's be active when you're listening to books. Um, so if you're doing something physical and something that might be repetitive, so that it doesn't allow you to. Uh, so it doesn't occupy your mind space and you're just doing a physical action that is repetitive. It can be helpful to retain what you're listening to. Okay, so which out of the 52 books that you read and listened to this year, which was the best sort of book? Really sort of, it's very difficult to obviously pick one, but talk about some of the interesting things that you read. Oh, I, I want to link this back to uh, Nitin actually. So we recorded this episode, um, we recorded a similar episode same time last year, if you guys remember. And and I think in that episode, we Manoj and I both had this realization that we had some sort of tunnel vision, basically. Um, and my tunnel vision was that I relentlessly focused on tech for like 30 books a year. And that was, I mean, I knew a lot about, you know, tech in general and different aspects of it. But I didn't really know stuff about history or, or, or psychology and stuff like that. And so when Nathan said that, you know, it might be interesting to read about democracy and, and so on and so forth, other topics that are generally not my area of expertise. I, I decided to implement some of that this year. So thanks, Nitin. Um, and so I have, um, I think, six non-tech recommendations. The first couple of um, them are good economics for hard times and poor economics. Uh, generally, I'm not someone who who digests economics uh, at a good pace. But this, this one is actually quite an exception, both of these. Um, poor economics and good economics for hard times are excellent reads. Uh, it just really opens your mind to so much that's happening in India and around the world. And Abhijit Banerjee and Esther Daflo are not just, um, I, I, hope, I hope I'm not butchering her name, uh, but they're not, they're not just only good at their jobs, they're also really good at telling people what they do. So just 100% strongly recommend it. Um, there's also a bunch of history stuff that I did. So I read this book called Inglorious Empire that talked about, um, it talked about the British Raj in India. Uh, Shashi Tharoor, uh, I listened to this one actually, and to my delight, Shashi Tharoor was the one who was narrating it. So just having him in your ears for like 20 hours on end was, I don't think there's an experience in audiobooks that quite compares to it. I read Alexander Hamilton all about his life. Uh, he is one of the founding fathers of the United States. And it's it's absolutely mind-blowing to to read about this guy because I think, I think the biographer says that, Ron Cherno says that in the biography, but I think He's someone who's written the most of any man who lived in his lifetime. And his some of his works include, um, like he, he was pretty active during the time the, the American constitution was being formed. He also wrote a set of papers called the Federalist Papers. And so the idea was to for Hamilton, Madison and John Jay to write a series of essays, uh, 25 essays. And Hamilton is so good at writing. He, he's so prolific. He wrote 51 essays when the goal was for these three guys to write 25 combined. So just, I strongly recommend you read that. It's, it's quite inspirational. There's one book called Fear and Loathing in La Liga. It's about Spanish football and um, the rivalry between Barcelona and Real Madrid. And finally, there's, there's one, I think this is the most special book uh, this year because mental health has been such a focus for me. Um, it's called Maybe You Should Talk to Someone. It's by this author called Laurie Gottelab. I'm definitely screwing her name up. But um, it's about, it's the story of a therapist and her therapist and her patients. So it's, it just puts mental health into such an interesting context, given that 2020 has been so hard for all of us. Um, so yeah, that's my non-tech uh, reading list recommendations. That's a fascinatingly broad reading list. I mean, I wouldn't have uh, thought that those are the kind of uh, different things that you would have read. I mean, you've clearly taken that conversation from the year before uh, seriously uh, to address a tunnel vision, something that I did not do at all this year. <laughs> uh, but, but before I get to that, Nitin, I want to come to you. What have you spent your time reading in 2020? Yeah, so you guys want me to talk about the fiction part or the non-fiction part because both are interesting. Uh, I mean, the, the lists are long in both cases, uh, but I'd focus just on a few, but you choose. Should I talk about fiction or should I talk about non-fiction? Non -fiction? Let's talk, no, let's start with fiction, right? I mean, that's the really more interesting thing. Uh, fiction, you know, I've uh, discovered David Mitchell, I think either in 2020 or 2019, I can't remember, uh, with this book called The Cloud Atlas. Uh, and it's written in a wonderful way. You know, uh, Cloud Atlas is about six or seven stories, you know, put together in a very 
uh, I mean, to explain it would be a spoiler, but uh, you know, put together in a very nice way. And I liked what he'd written. So I read his other books, Ghost Written, uh, The Bone Clocks, and The Thousand Autumns of Jacob de Zoot, uh, which, is, which is a very interesting book set, set in 16th century Japan. Uh, and he's a Dutch, uh, he's a Dutch merchant who's uh, stationed in Japan and lots of things happen there. So David Mitchell is very, very good. And he's, you know, his books are all interconnected in some way. So they call it the Mitchell verse. And uh, you find uh, characters and incidents being sort of gently cross-referenced in other things. So I liked uh, David Mitchell a lot. And I would recommend this to anybody who wants to read good, uh, you know, good uh, writing. It's very difficult to fix it in a genre. It's probably... Partly science fiction, partly magic fantasy, partly, uh, you know, mystery and history. I don't know what it is, but it's, it's really nice. The other book I think I would really recommend is uh, Piranesi by Susanna Clark. Uh, it's, again, I think this would be magical realism, fantasy. Again, I can't uh, classify it very easily. Uh, and to explain, basically about this guy is in a big house uh, uh, is it, you know, is this mysterious guy in a mysterious house and the story unfolds from there. Uh, Susanna Clark. Susanna Clark was also the person who wrote uh, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norell about 20 years ago. Uh, a killer of a book, a superb book. And Piranesi is a great, uh, you know, second book by that same person. Second or third book. Then there are a few others I would put in the more or less in the same vein. The Maker of Swans by uh, Parekh O'Donnell. Road 7 by Keith Rawson, Till by Daniel Kelman, and a lot of books by uh, Paul Oster. Paul Oster is another interesting uh, author and his audiobooks, Rohan, in case you're interested, his audiobooks are also narrated by him. So in case you want to stop being a Shashi Tharoor fanboy and <laughs> to some other authors, uh, Paul Oster is good. He And I think his, he, his narration is in the you know, in a style that uh, is consistent with the with the stories that he writes. Again, these all these books, you know, they are, they are fiction with a little bit of a twist, uh, you know, uh, in a in a different dimension, right? They take you in a different dimension, and uh, somehow uh, I've been reading this kind of fiction over the last two years. And like Rohan, you know, I read part of it online, uh, in a in, on a in an ebook, part of it in a physical book, then part of it as a audio book. So wherever the the uh, narrators are good, the audio book makes a lot of sense. So that's the, I limited there. I've read a few other uh, pieces of fiction also, but let's uh, let's let's focus on the good ones, right? See, these are the ones I would recommend uh, people read, uh, and uh, it really opens up different ways of thinking for you. Ronan, how about you? Did you sort of take some time to go into fiction? Um, I think apart from the book on therapy, the maybe you should talk to someone. Um, that's fiction, but I think that's the only one that that's other genre. Nothing else. That's that's interesting. I mean, I I don't think even I uh, sort of picked up a single uh, fiction book through the year. Uh, I mean, it was uh, all largely non-fiction, which uh, you know, and so uh, again, so that's something that I need to promise myself to do this year <laughs> is to diversify what I'm reading. But then let's come back to the non-fiction that you read. What are the things? To, what would you recommend this year? I mean, this been it's been a difficult year. Uh, but it's also been a year which, you know, where we feel like we're at the cusp of major changes around the world, not just sort of geopolitics, but also technology uh, in terms of economic philosophy and so on and so forth. So what does one do to sort of get uh, a sense of what the next decade starts to hold for us? And what are the books that sort of talk to that that you probably read this year? See, this year, uh, you know, I would put, uh, let, let me just divide this into two categories. Okay, one big category is the books that I read related to the public policy work that we do, right? And that we are interested in. So that's that's one category of books. And the other category of books is just generally no really, no reason to read it, but just for, you know, interesting knowledge gathering and expansion of your knowledge, no real, you know, profitability in the, the reason why you read it. Okay, so there, there are two reasons. One is nonfiction, which is related to public policy. And the second is nonfiction, which is related to nothing but uh, just to enjoy yourself. So in the in the first category, uh, again, there are four four broad threads and those were more or less related to the last year. The first set was about pandemics. The second thread was about China, the border issues and the maritime issues. Third thread was about information politics. And the fourth thread was about diversity. Okay. 
Uh, let me start. The, you know, in the pandemic, you know, what happened is very early in the pandemic, I started reading Adam Kucharski's book called The R- Rules of Contagion. And uh, Adam Kucharski is actually now involved in the pandemic planning and, uh, you know, plan- pandemic policy work in the UK right now. Uh, and he's, he's a, you know, he's a modeler, epidemiologist, uh, speaks the language of data, etc. So uh, I could sort of quickly get a handle on uh, epidemiology thanks to that book. Uh, and then uh, there are two other classics in that uh, field, which I think everyone should read. And they're very easy to read. Okay, Epidemics and Society by Frank Snowden and Plagues and Peoples by William McNeil. These were written, I think, in the 80s and the 90s. Uh, so that was when AIDS was the big uh, problem where everybody was uh, dealing with. And they talk about the history of the world uh, and how epidemics and uh, and pandemics have, uh, you know, co-evolved with humanity over the last, uh, you know, recorded part of history. Uh, but I think Kucharski's book is really good because it's analytical. It also has a little bit of uh, uh, recent uh, anecdotes and recent case studies, which he talks about. And he wrote this before COVID-19. So uh, in that sense, it's a very good introduction to the state of human knowledge and epidemiology before, just before the pandemic hit us. And it's really, really good. So a lot of uh, uh, the subsequent policy-related work that we did as Tafshishila was influenced by some of these books, uh, Kucharski, Snowden, McNeil, and there are a whole lot of others, but that'll read like a bibliography, uh, which I don't want to get into, right? If I have to pick three, these would be the three. Then the second category would be uh, the China-India uh, uh, border issues. And uh, uh, the related part is maritime because I focus a lot on maritime strategy, right? So it's very important for us to periodically go back and look at the history of the India-China dispute, right? Because this is about 100, 110, 120 years old. And uh, unless you understand how the dispute evolved over various periods of time, it's very hard for us to get a sense of what really is happening and what India ought to do, right? So, of course, there are famous books uh, which have been written in the past, both by Indian and foreign authors, uh, these are very famous books. So I, I didn't, you don't need to name mention it. But what I was reading was the CIO, CIA's uh, uh, declassified archives. They are called the Polo Papers. And they are available online at the CIA's website. And these are a series of CIA reports of what happened in the 50s and the 60s, uh, you know, through the 50s and the early 60s, up, leading up to the India-China War of 1962. And it makes fantastic reading. Uh, it tells you, you know, what exactly was happening and what was what what the U.S. thought was going on in the minds of uh, the leaders of India and China at that time, and so on. Very interesting. And one of the things I found there is that, you know, at a broad level, nothing much has changed because the political leadership then Nehru and the political leadership now Modi are both saying, literally saying, look, uh, China is much bigger than us now. We should just bide our time and wait for a more favorable moment when the balance of power is uh, much more in our favor before we do anything, right? So <laughs> it's not changed much. Uh, the balance of power, if anything, has shifted away from us in the last 20, 25 years. So the CIA Polo Papers are very important reading for anybody who's interested in this. And you'll, you know, you get to know how lucidly and clearly the analysts write. The CIA analysts, the writing is just so good. It's very clear uh, and very, very succinct. Uh, and, you know, the language is so... I would recommend it to anyone who wants to be a policy analyst. The second uh, two books I would talk about more, they are not so much China, but about maritime issues and 1971 because Navy celebrated the uh, the Navy Day, uh, the 50th anniversary uh, recently. And leading up to it, we were talking about a lot of things. And two books which come to mind are The Navy, A Nation and Its Navy at War by uh, Ranjit Rai. Uh, it talks about naval operations uh, in 1971, and Operation X by Captain Samant and Sandeep Unnithan. Uh, it's about a special opera- special forces operation conducted by uh, the Indian Navy during the 1971 war. It's not China, but it's it's got maritime strategy in it. So the evolution of India's maritime strategy is something which interests me because now we have to think beyond uh, Bay of Bengal and uh, Arabian Sea. We have to be thinking of the South China Sea, Western Pacific, and uh, the Southern Indian Ocean. But it, you know, the, the, the stories of what happened in the minds of naval leadership at that time are quite, quite interesting. And these two books uh, bring that out quite well. The third one is really, which is really the, the focus of what I'm trying to work on 
uh, and I've been trying to work on for the last two to three years, is this idea of uh, the politics of the information age. Uh, it's a new field. All of us are trying to grapple with this. You know, if you remember, so I came up with this idea of nations, nations or imagined communities online about 12 years ago. And what I sort of expected has come about. And now I'm trying to grapple with what are the consequences of this and, you know, how do, how do we do politics? How do you do democracy? How do you do strategy in the information age? Uh, a few good books, Jamie Suskin's Future Politics, which we recommend under Takshashila Technology and Policy Program. Uh, it's really good. Uh, Future Politics, he lays it out. He has a big, good framework for it, which I, I, I would recommend everyone read. And uh, the second uh, book is called Cyber Strategy by Brandon Valeriano and company. Uh, these are people from the US, uh, uh, I think, Naval War College. And uh, they talk about uh, cyber strategy in the context of international relations. Uh, very, very interesting, uh, very interesting book and quite timely. Uh, the Hacker in the State by Ben Buchanan uh, and The Kill Chain by Christian uh, Bros. I think these these are all American authors, and I think they've been uh, far more candid and forthright about analysis than what you would read from analysts elsewhere. Because when it comes to information politics, a lot of people profess to know more than they do. And I like books which try to lay out the facts and point out uh, how little we know or how little that the governments are actually doing. Uh, in this regard. So it's a little unsettling for most people, but I think it's good to have a grip, grip of uh, the cyber uh, world, you know, especially in the strategic domain. By the way, I've started using the word cyber as a noun. So uh, a lot of people are going to be upset with me, but I think it's time to use cyber as a noun because cyber space doesn't cut it because it's not just about space. It's beyond that. So that's it. And by the way, I just want to end with uh, another piece of work, which I'm working on in the past few years it's on studying diversity and comes from the realization that India is an incredibly diverse country. And the question is, how does diversity affect human cooperation? Right. So uh, a lot of work being done in this, in, uh, in the academic space. And the book I would recommend is uh, called Diversity and Complexity by Scott Page. Okay, this is a deep mathematical book. Uh, I mean, to the extent that... Uh, Ordinary people can think of deep mathematics because you can go deeper and deeper into mathematics. But I think this is mathematical, but it talks about diversity and complexity in a very intelligent way uh, and with frameworks that uh, we can put our heads around. Fascinating. So, I mean, I'm going to stick with the thread of, uh, you know, the cyber thread uh, and technology uh, with that. Rohan, I want to come to you. You did talk about the technology books on tech that you read, let's go to that tunnel vision that you had. What were the interesting tech books that you read? Because you wrote a lot on tech. So let's listen to what you read. Um, okay. I mean, there's so much um, of tech literature that's out there that it can be a bit dizzying. Um, but um, here are the top few ones that I liked last year. Uh, I think the first one, it has to be uh, Rahul Mathan's Privacy 3.0. I have no idea how I've uh, managed to survive in this field without reading this book so far. It's excellent. It's a foundational look at privacy, what it's meant throughout the history of mankind up until this very point today. So if you're working in tech and policy or are also just mildly interested in why privacy is important and how it shapes up all of this Apple, Facebook, Google ecosystem, I strongly, I, I, I don't think I can recommend it um, more strongly than I'm going to do it now. It's just a foundational read for anyone who wants to look at tech. I also, I, th I think that's the first book that's sort of India focused. The second one is, is called Midnight's Machines. It's by Arun Mohan Sukumar. Um, and I, I'm, I'm so happy I'm not butchering this name up. It's excellent. It talks about Madan Mohan Malviya and the influence that he's had over, over BJP and um, Narendra Modi and um, basically how his vision of, you know, India doing more in tech has shaped up the philosophy of the ruling party. And if, if I can just if I can sort of interrupt there. So this is one of the books that even I read this year and I was really uh, taken in by it uh, just to sort of, just the way, firstly, it's written in an extremely engaging fashion. And secondly, just the history uh, that, you know, you know, but you don't really know. 
and putting it in the context of sort of this is a take on India's history and India's sort of twist with technology and modern India's twist with technology, and I sort of second that recommendation. And I think it was fascinating. Also, sort of, I want to also add there is this podcast episode with my first two favorite authors of these books um, by in Rahul Matan's uh, podcast Ex Machina. He does an episode with Arun Mohan Sukumar, and if you don't have time to read the book, uh, go through that podcast episode. It is. It's fascinating how India's technology history has shaped up. It's just like from the solar cooker to Jawaharlal Nehru to Indira Gandhi. It, it, it's so much and it's excellent. So, and it's explained in a really lucid manner. So third one, I would, I would say it's um, 26 words that created the internet. And it's about this law, I think, which is also in pretty, how do you say it? In, in vogue now. Donald Trump has been trying to take down Section 230. And which is sort of stupid to me because it's like if if you did not have Section 230, Donald Trump could not exist on Twitter. It would just be he would just be too much of a liability to be on there, as would so much of the, of the Republican Party. So um, why Section 230 was passed into law is extremely important to understand because it's basically a history of incentives. People kept on trying to sue these big companies who were tech platforms because they would they had an incentive to do so. Because these tech platforms would give them a lot more money than any other person that they could sue. Um, so I, I strongly recommend reading it and just look at how incentives have shaped up this whole industry and how the US has just leapfrogged ahead of everyone else. All thanks to Section 230. That's been really nicely in this book. I think the, the author is Jeff Kosef. And um, yeah, so great recommendation. A few others, I think there's one called Super Pumped. It's about the history of Uber. And I think it's probably the most to- toxic work culture that I have ever heard about. It's um, it's quite something to read to to just read that book. It's by Mike Isaac of the New York Times. And when you're using the app, you don't realize how much history just led to this app being what it is today. Um, from fights with Apple to just really sexist work culture. It's it's absolutely it's enlightening to read it. I I think the the whistleblower Susan Fowler now works at New York Times, so it's sort of poetic now. But um, strongly recommend that you read it. Um, in a similar vein, uh, but in a more interesting one, I imagine, is, is a book called We Are the Nerds. It's about the history of Reddit. I mean, I've gone through a lot of companies' history in, in this past few years, Google, Facebook, and so on, Instagram. But Reddit's history is is quite fascinating because it's a website that I I spend a lot of time at, mostly because the comments are gold. But if you just look at the history of Reddit and how it came about as a concept, it's it's sale to Condé Nast and, and so on. It tells you about the fears of content moderation because when it was starting out, a bunch of uh, people that were making this company into an app and so on, um, these guys had to moderate Reddit's content and a significant amount of them underwent post-traumatic stress disorder. So if you're wondering why these content moderation jobs are, are not done by executives in big companies, uh, this is a pretty interesting read into that. And also goes into the history of Y Combinator and and Paul Graham and and so on and so forth. So excellent read um, about an area of tech or platforms that's not generally referred to a lot. And finally, I think um, my recommendation is this very small book called The Curse of Bigness. Uh, it's by Professor Tim Wu. It's a history of antitrust and and how this domain has shaped up over the years. And it was quite fascinating to me because um, basically this comes from a time of Teddy Roosevelt and um, Standard Oil, Rockefeller and, and Carnegie and so on. And this debate has progressed so much because believe it or not, there was a time when there was genuine discourse about whether or not competition itself is good for the economy. So it's taken a hundred years, but now there is general consensus that competition is generally a good thing to have. So it's it's a great read told really well. It's It's not a big book. I think it's also on Audible. So I strongly recommend you read it because this antitrust stuff is not going to go away anytime soon. And if you want to understand where all of this is coming from, the curse of weakness should be your foundation reading. So I, I think I'll, I'll stop there. Those are my top reads on tech. Uh, we can go into other, other stuff. Oh, okay. I think I've made notes of some of these and I think I'm going to try and pick up and read some of these. But I want to end uh, this conversation uh, and we'll try and see if we can put out some of our top uh, three for each of us uh, in the show notes so that people who want to go and check them out can go and check them out. I just want to end with uh, a couple of uh, books that I thought were interesting. Again, like I said, I didn't break through my tunnel vision this year. I stuck to reading a lot of China. 
Uh, and there were three books that I want to recommend to people who want to read, not necessarily all new. The first of which uh, is uh, Mao's Last Revolution. This uh, is a look at the Cultural Revolution. Uh, when I first started reading this book, it was very early in this year. It's an old book. Um, and uh, I must say that uh, within the first chapter, uh, I felt so deeply... Uh, shocked by the way events were flowing that I sort of paused and it took me some time to come back to it. But uh, I purposely chose to read this along with uh, another old book by Kao Hua, uh, which is called How the Red Sun Rose, uh, The Origins and Development of the Yanan Rectification Movement. Again, uh, if you read these two books together, uh, they talk about two different periods, about 20, 25 years apart, 25 years apart, 25, 30 years apart, which... uh, uh, are two different revolutions that were launched by Mao Zedong, again, deeply relevant to today's China. And not just today's China, uh, as you read, you get a sense of the relevance of the shrinking political space uh, within, of course, the Communist Party at that point of time. But you can obviously find reflections in the world today around us and also beyond China. So I think uh, that uh, in some ways it's quite a disturbing experience to read both of these together. Uh, But uh, doing it sort of gave me the fullest sense of dread that people might have felt uh, while these things were taking place. So I do recommend uh, you take a look at these, uh, particularly if you're somebody who's interested in China and internal political developments of the Communist Party. The last book that I would want to recommend is uh, something that I think I've spoken about within our office conversations uh, frequently in the last month and a half, which is a new book by Bill Hayden called The Invention of China. To me, this is one of the most fascinating books I've read on China in the recent times. It talks about uh, uh, the invention of the idea of modern day China. You know, we see this conversation playing out in India also about the idea of India and how old is the, is this notion uh, of this concept of India um, and how, you know, uh, there are different sides of uh, different groups in India who would be arguing about how India is an is a, you know, centuries, millennia old concept of civilization, which is extremely old, to the other side of the argument about the Republic. Uh, And you see some similar shades playing out within this book where essentially the argument is about how a bunch of intellectuals uh, largely uh, at different points of time in in exile uh, during the Qing dynasty in the late 1800s and the early 1900s construct the idea of uh, China as an as a state, as a nation, as a territory, and how that continues to have implications uh, in the modern world, uh, most obviously in the context of the territorial dispute between China and India. So I do recommend these three books uh, if you're interested in understanding China a little bit more deeply. Uh, So yeah, so with that, I just want to go back to both of you guys for some last thoughts. Nitin, first you, and then we close through on. So I wanted to save the best for the last and uh, recommend uh, a few books which I've been reading through the year, I mean, uh, aimlessly reading through the year uh, of the pandemic. Uh, the first one, uh, which I read from, you know, early January to the probably the end of December was Ideas by Peter Watson. It's a huge book. It's a history of ideas from fire to Freud, as he puts it in a subtitle. And it talks about the intellectual uh, journey which humankind has taken from fire to Freud. Right. So it's very, very interesting. Uh, and I think every educated person should read this. You know, it's 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 a long book, but a very readable book. And I think every educated person should read it. Right. It's, it's like a toolkit of what it means to be educated. The second book which I read through the year was The War That Ended Peace by Margaret Macmillan. This is about uh, how the First World War came about. And from, you know, it's roughly a history of Europe from 1870 to 1914. Very riveting. It reads like a thriller, right? And Margaret Macmillan has a new book on war. And this is her first book, I think. And uh, really a big fat book, but a very good book to read. So these are books which you can just read, you know, chapter by chapter. You don't need to go uh, full hog. It's it's something to keep on your table or by your bedside and read whenever you have time. The Rig Veda uh, is a very, you know, a lot of people would, you know, celebrate and worship the Rig Veda without even actually reading it. And I would be one of them. I would I probably have scratched the surface in terms of trying to read it over the last 10, 15 years. Uh, but this translation by Joel Brereton and Stephanie Jameson, uh, it's a, it's, it's a three volume translation plus a one, one volume introduction. 
And uh, I was reading the one volume introduction. It's fascinating. Okay. It's really, really fascinating. I would recommend everyone to read this also. You know, it's about how a bunch of people, uh, you know, over a period of 2000 years came up with this text, which we now know as the Rig Veda, you know, from, from isolated uh, hymns and poetry uh, uh, sung during the consumption of Soma to uh, what we have now. It's a very interesting read. And I think uh, it's a pity that the book is not available uh, in an Indian edition, but but the, the introduction is available. And finally, the book I would recommend everyone to read as a, as a hopeful uh, note, uh, you know, as a hopeful, not so much as it's not based so much on hard science, but more on hope. It's called Humankind, A Hopeful History by Rutger Bregman. I think it tries to find uh, positive angles and hope amid all the darkness that we see in current times. So it's a very thin book. You can, you can read it in an hour or two if you are, if you are really quick about it. People like Rohan probably can read it in half an hour. <laughs> but, but, but I would really suggest that, you know, everybody pick up Rutger Bregman's Humankind, A Hopeful History. And to base our expectations on hope and positivity amid all the realism, skepticism, cynicism and negativity that we see around us. So this is a change that 2020 has brought. The realist in Nitin is now giving way to the much more hopeful future, <laughs> which is also a good thing. Uh, Rohan, I want to come to you. Uh, last thoughts. Uh, are we going to read 104 this year? No, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Uh, but... One thing I am going to do this year is um, read more academic papers. And here's where my complimentary Tashila podcast plug comes in. I've started a newsletter for myself um, to record my readings and also just talk about tech academia and making it more accessible to people who are not actually just reading tech papers all the time, unlike me. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make all of these complex papers that I read actually into bite-sized um, Newsletters, it's gonna, I'm going to try to make them into a one-minute read. And I'm not going to do any justice to the nuance of these papers, but um, that's not the point. So, yeah, I'm going to start a newsletter. I think it's already out. So I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes. But there's that. Also, one other thing, uh, the final book recommendation that I, that I want to end this one on is is about personal finance. I started reading a book on, on personal finance. Um, I finished it earlier this year. It's called... Let's Talk Money by Monica Hullen. She's a Mint columnist. And 2020 has taught me a lot about money and my relationship with it. So this is not some self-improvement, self-help book, but just a book on how markets operate, why one scheme is better than the other, and so on, and what to look for. So, um, yeah, sorry about that random personal finance plug. But that's what I want to end on. Um, more personal finance, more memoirs, and uh, more tech academia literature for 2021. That's it. All right, that sounds fascinating. And personal finance, you never need to apologize. I think it is extremely important that all of us take care of that too. Uh, with that, thank you so much, Nathan. Thank you so much, Rohan. Uh, and thank you so much, folks, for listening. We'll try and plug everything in the show notes so that you can uh, take a look at the different books if you've missed out on some of the names. Um, but yeah, do stay tuned uh, and have a good 2021. Thank you so much. Please consider signing up for Takshashila's courses. Applications are now open and you can apply at www.takshashila.org.in slash courses. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy, and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at takshashilainst or our website takshashila.org.in. I hope you enjoyed that show. If you aren't following us on social media, it's 2021 now. It's time you did. You didn't in 2020. That was bad enough. But now in 2021, you really, really should. It's IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram.
And a quick reminder to everybody, just please help us out with our survey, ivmpodcast.com slash survey. We've had a number of you fill it out so far, but we want to shatter last year's number, right? Really, really blow that up. Go fill out the survey over there. If you do, we'll select from the emails that we have got submitted, and we'll be sending out some interesting swag to people. So what should you be listening to this week? First thing I want to talk about is the unprecedented episode. We did a triple crossover. Vineet Kanobar from Storytellers and Storytellers, Varun Dugirala from Advertising is Dead, and Karthik Nagarajan from the Filter Coffee Podcast all got together and put together a mega episode. Do check it out on whichever of their feeds you want is available on all three. On Nankari, the guy spoke about the history of alcohol in India. It's got a longer history than people would think. Definitely do check it out. Another show I want to call out this week a little bit is The Note by Maruk Inayat. Maruk had two fantastic episodes this week. She did her first episode with Amitabh Mathu about the elections in Kashmir, and then she did another one where she told the story of how she faked her identity to interview Benazir Bhutto. Definitely do check it out. And with that, I hope to see you again next week. Whether you're an established sports person or a budding one, or simply a sports enthusiast, join us, Tanvi and Shlok. We are two passionate pro badminton players talking policy, mindset and everything sport. So tune in to the Millennial Athlete every Monday. Only on the IBM Podcast Network. Trust us, it's going to be lit.